you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. I never uh, put a title on my sermons, but today I'm calling it an extra beatitude. An extra beatitude. We've been looking at the beatitudes in uh, Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the beginning there. But um, our series was called Only Believe. And it's because there are some things that we say that we believe. There's some truths that we hold, and I think sometimes we put them in a, a file somewhere in the back of our mind and put it up there with the, all the the library of all those things that we have learned over the years. But sometimes we uh, need to take those things and put them back into our life, those truths that are there. We need to, to remove them from the library and get out and read them again. Look at those principles and precepts and start trying to bring it back into your active life. If you were going to go out and buy a new vehicle, all right, You'd look at it. You'd probably do some research on it. Some of you would crunch the numbers a little bit and think about it. You would want to make sure that it was the right color. And then if you got to thinking about it, uh, there would be some uh, emotions that would come. There would be those endorphins that would start popping. Dopamine would start flowing from your mind. And you'd have all these really good feelings about it, or not. But all those things would happen. But sooner or later... You need to get in it, put the key in it, and take it out for a test drive, right? I don't know how many of us could buy a vehicle without first trying it out, right? Just uh, let's see if, it's, if it suits us. Let's, let's just see how well it fits us, so to speak. Well, there's a lot of truths that we have, that we look at them and we admire them. There's a lot of things that we say, you know, that's, that's good. I, that, I like that. But sometimes we need to put the keys in it, and take it out for a test drive. Maybe we need to make sure that it fits. Maybe, maybe we need to make sure that it's ours. And if it is, then let's make it our daily driver. Amen? I know I'm taking this analogy a little far, but I mean, you gotta, you got to depend on it. You want to be able to go out there and make sure that it cranks and runs every day. Just not, you know, you don't want to have to worry about it and fuss with it. And I can only drive it when it's dry, not when it's raining. Or I can only dry, drive it when it's hot, not cold, or whatever. Look, if you want a daily driver, it needs to be good in any day, any circumstance, any place, any time. Amen? There's some truths that we hold that we may only want to pull out in certain circumstances, but we don't know if it's our daily driver. We don't know if it's something that would fit our circumstances in life every day. We're not too sure about that. And that's what this this series has been about. James 1.22 says, be a doer. We we should, it's in the plural, we should be doers of the word, not hearers only. There's some things that we have grown to, to believe, but yet not too sure how they're impacting our our every day. And as we've looked at the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, the attitudes that we need to be, we need to follow, we need to believe, we need to trust. Hopefully when we were going through this, there, there were some truths there you may have been reminded of. Maybe they got put on the back burner a little bit. Maybe you forgot the nuances of them. But maybe there were some things that as we went through this, you, you heard Christ speak for the first time. Maybe there's something that that Christ wanted to share with you personally about this kind of a blessed life, and it's nice to be able to hear from him about where you are and where you're going through. So whether you were reminded of those things or whether you learned some new truths from Christ, I think there's one more that comes from Christ that we need to remember. One more of those attitudes that will bring us joy and peace that God wants to be a part of our every day. So if you have your Bible, take them and uh, stand with me, please, in honor of reading God's Word. In Matthew chapter number 11, we'll begin reading in verse number 
2. When John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, praise God. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Now hear this extra beatitude. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is always an honor and a privilege to read your word. I take it as a special honor that you've allowed me to come today and to expound upon your word, to, as you have spoken into my heart, Lord, that you would speak to others in the same way. We trust your word. We believe your word. We honor you, the God of the word, the author and the finisher of the faith. But Lord, like I said, sometimes there's some things that we know that we need to make sure that they are a part of our life so that we can take your admonition to live in the peace and the joy that comes from knowing you and following you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, we ask this once again. Honor your word. Holy Spirit, speak the words of Jesus to us today. Let us hear as they heard in that day. And Father, by the power of the Spirit of God, may the blessings flow today just as richly as it did in that day. You can do that, and you have before. And Lord, we trust that you will do it again. For your honor, for your glory, but Lord, we claim for our benefit. You are our King, our Savior, the Master who loved us enough to die on the cross of Calvary, to pay our penalty of our sins, to go to the point of giving death, giving life up so that you could take it again full and free for us. Father, may we hear the message. And as we hear, may we believe and walk in it. May we be doers of the word, not hearers only. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Matthew 11 is the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was spoken of in the Old Testament. They told of the one who would come, who would be the forerunner, the one who would get the path ready, get the roads ready for Jesus to come, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, that he would take the mountains and lower them, that he would take the valleys and raise them up so that the path of Christ could come on a straight road. John, a cousin of Jesus, did not know him well, but yet when the call of God came upon his life individually, he received that call and lived it out. He did not think it was a, a great sacrifice. He fully yielded himself to it. It took him to places that he probably would not have gone. Dressing in the dress that he did made him look seen uh, as a radical to some, but it was fine with him. Following the diet that he went, not living for the things of the world, not taking the gifts that he had to make money or even to make influence, but simply living out God's call in his life was the greatest honor that he could do and he freely gave himself to it and as God poured into him 
He didn't just sit back and wait for those to come to him. He would go and he would say, thus saith the Lord. And the Lord was there and, and took the words of John, very harsh words, very difficult words to hear. But the Lord anointed those words and it found the right place in people's hearts. And as he preached, repentance, sinners, turn from your sins, turn from your evil ways, turn to the holy God and follow him. People listened, heard, believed, and lives were changed. They were baptized unto new life. The Holy Spirit was there to honor in such an amazing way. Now, when Jesus' ministry began, when he had been quiet all those years, 30 years of humbly just taking the, the right path that God had for him, now it was his time to come forth and speak the things of God. But the first thing that he did was to go find John in the wilderness and to be baptized by him. Sometimes people make little of what Jesus made much of. Sometimes people follow the wisdom of this world and say, that's really not necessary, that's really not important. But Jesus said baptism was important. It's one of the two ordinances that we have in our church. Baptism, we'll follow the second one today, in the Lord's Supper, the, the bread and the juice that represent the body of Christ. And Jesus went, John said, no, I'm not worthy to do this. Jesus said, do it. And he did. And Jesus was lowered under the water, dying to himself while still living, raised, as we said, to walk in newness of life, a life solely yielded to the path of God for him. At the beginning of his ministry, he showed the purpose of his ministry, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection by, why, by where we find life. John was so honored. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And at that time, Jesus began his ministry, but also at that time, John's ministry began to diminish. Now, he was okay with that. He must increase, I must decrease. And the disciples that were following him now began to filter and follow Jesus. He was okay with that. The crowds grew smaller, but his ministry continued on. And somewhere in that ministry, he ran across the one that you and I know as Herod. Herod's dad was a super evil person. And Herod kind of fell into that same privileged way of life, thinking that simply because of who he was, others should bow down to his every thought and whim. He could do whatever he wanted. Herod really believed that he could make truth. Now, we don't know how it came about. We don't know the circumstances, but somewhere in there, the words of John, it may have been actually in the presence of Herod, but, but John the Baptist called him out. Because you see, Herod liked his sister-in-law, his brother's wife, to the point that he took her and made her his own wife. Herodias. Boy, what a name. She was evil too. John didn't like, or Herod didn't like it that John called him out. You shouldn't be with your brother's wife. That's wrong. And I don't know if it was just saving face or what it was, but Herod had John put in prison. Most of y'all know the story of the circumstances that were, happened to him at the end. But we don't know how long John was in prison. Probably not too long, but 
it was in the first year of Jesus' ministry. It could have been six, eight, ten months, twelve months, I don't know. But sitting in prison, John got to wondering. All my life, I've given myself to do the will of God. Freely accepted it. Been okay with it. And God has honored it. God has blessed. God has been with me. And now, I didn't do anything wrong. I just spoke the truth. Boldly proclaimed. They didn't like it. And here I am finding myself in jail. And I think that the one who likes to chatter, the one who likes to speak evil into us, the one that likes to come into our circumstances and distort and lead us in paths that we really shouldn't follow, that aren't truth, because he's a liar. Satan is the father of lies. Satan likes to separate. Satan likes to distort. Satan likes to get us to go down wrong paths. John began to listen to the chatterbox. I wonder if he is the one. So he got two of his disciples and said, go ask him. Go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one? Or do we look for another? Are you the one? Or do we look for another? Church, listen to me. In his heart of hearts, he knew. But in the clouded mind, he started to wonder. So his disciples did that. And they went to Jesus where he was. Jesus had sent out his disciples to do some work of the ministry as well during this time. And then when he was there, look what it says in in verse 2, when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, By the way, when Jesus answered, he didn't say yes. He didn't say no. He knew it would have stirred up one reaction or the other, no matter if he said yes or he said no. So he answered in a different way. Go tell John the things that you hear and see. Listen, church, first point. Go tell him the testimony of what's happening. Go tell the testimony of what you have seen and what you hear. Now, we don't know how long these two disciples were there until they got to have this conversation. But we know one thing, there was a crowd around Jesus that he was teaching to, and everywhere that he went, he was confronted with people with needs, and he always met the needs. Physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, all of them. So he said, just tell them the things that you see and hear. Verse 5, the blind see, that's a pretty good thing, amen? Somebody who has no ability to see, bam, they can see. They can go up and shake hands with someone. They can say, wow, I knew your voice, but now I can see you. The lame, the one not capable, now can. That's a pretty strong statement right there. To watch everybody else to do it, but now they, to knowing that they could not. They did not have the ability. But now the ones who could not can and they could get up and, and go and not have to wait on someone else's help. The lame can walk. The lepers, that disease that would come upon their body and spread. And, and, and it would absolutely take over things and rot them away. Literally, the flesh would rot away from them. They would die from the outside in. But then... They were healed. And I believe that when Jesus heals, he heals to the uttermost. Amen? He cleanses completely and totally. So I believe from flesh that was dying, I believe it was like a brand new baby's. Beverly liked that grandbaby so soft and so sweet and smells so wonderful. Amen? 
They could look and say, you, you remember? Look at me. That's what Christ did. He took the pain away. He took the ugliness away. He restored me. Oh, what about the ones who never could hear? By the way, things we take for granted every day. You're here today listening. Praise God for the ability to hear. The choir as they sang. The prayers as they're prayed. To hear as someone reads the Word of God. Praise God for the ability to hear. The things that we take for granted, one of the hardest things is someone who was born with an ability to hear and loses it and knows how much they've lost. The dead are raised up. Some people only think about the end of Jesus' ministry. When he went to the, to, to the widow of Nain and raised her son, or went to the, the grave and said, Lazarus, come forth, or went to the grave himself and came up on Resurrection Sunday, five weeks away, by the way. But he was doing this from the very beginning. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know the need, but we know that there was death. And every time that there's death, there's sorrow, there's heartache, there's loss. There's people whose, whose lives are crying out for the, for the loss of that loved one. We don't know if it's a spouse. We don't know if it's a child. We don't know if it's a dear friend or a neighbor. But somehow someone saw someone whose life had been taken, but Christ had an ability to give it back. What a wonderful Savior we have. And the poor, the underprivileged, the overlooked, they're undervalued. They have the good news of Christ <laughs> preached to them too. Others have advantages. Others have opportunities. But it's always that way in life that the overlooked are undervalued and not even seen. How terrible it would be for people to go through life and feel like they are not ever even seen. Just a, another bland face in the crowd. Just another voice that's never heard. Just another, another person with emotions that are overlooked with words that hit the floor. Oh, but they're cared about. And the one who came not to be served, but to serve, served them. The ground level at the foot of the cross. No big shots and little shots in heaven. Just children of the King. Someone that God loves so much that He would leave everything and take on the worst of things because they had value to Him. Go tell John what you've heard and what you've seen. And then he said these words. And blessed is he who is not offended at me. Blessed is he who's not offended because of me. The word offended. Skandad ido. It means when someone places a stumbling block or impediment in the way so that someone else could trip up on it or fall because of it. Listen to me. Don't miss the message. Here it is. To cause another to begin to distrust and desert one in whom he should trust and obey. It means to cause another to begin to distrust or desert one whom he should trust and obey. To distrust, to make to stumble. There are going to be times in our life that we're going to go through things that are going to be hard. There are things that we're going to go through that, that, we're, that are going to make us doubt the love and protection of God. But he says, 
Blessed are those who when the one comes to try to tell you not to follow, who tries to tell you that you don't need to trust this, who tries to tell you that your circumstances are here and God doesn't love you. One thing we've seen in the last couple weeks over what's happening in the Ukraine, it's tough. By the way, none of us know that toughness. None of us have had a place where the tanks come rolling in. None of us have had to go through that and endure that. And yet, one of the things that's amazed me about what is going on there is people who had a belief and a trust who put it into action and said, there's something greater than simply what I'm going through and I will yield myself to that. And their claim and their love for freedom has pushed them forward even though they're having to walk through difficult circumstances. I don't know what we have had to go through, but I tell you, Satan will try to tell you not to follow it, to, to not to trust God, not to believe God, that there's another way, or just to walk away. And there are too many people who are angry at God, who've lost their trust in God, who've lost their belief in God, who don't think that God loves them, who don't think that God cares about them in their circumstance. They have allowed themselves to fall into this place where they have become offended at Christ. But Jesus says, blessed, happy, at peace is the one who doesn't let those things separate us. When those things are there, come on now, God looks at your life, God knows it. Not one thing happens to you in your circumstances that doesn't go through the loving hand, the loving hand, the protecting hand, the caring hand of God first. And as you face that emotion, and as you face that hardship, and as you wonder why, and as you put question marks there, never put that question mark on God. Satan wants to, to lead you away from. How many times I've counseled those who a broken marriage led them away from God. An addiction led them away from God. A financial hardship, losing a job, led them away from God. A circumstance between family members and they got away from God. Isn't it funny how good Satan is to come in there and put the little prick there that can take you away? I think about Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament because God could so speak through him in his circumstance. And God blessed him, I said this Wednesday night, God, God, God allowed him to go into the third heaven, have a vision in the third heaven. What a great glory to be able to see the very presence of the glory of God in the amazing way. But with that came a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. And though he prayed for it to be removed, it never was removed. Now hear me, here, here's the point. He never allowed it to take him away from God. It drew him close. And he found the blessing and the peace and the love and the anointing of the happiness and the joy of God in that circumstance. That's the gospel. Here's the truth. The most powerful thing in all the earth today any day, forever, is the gospel. There is nothing that can rival it. Nothing. If you're adding anything to the gospel in your life, you're actually adding an impediment to joy. You may look at it and say, but if only, hold on, if you add anything in your life, I'm not saying that there are not joys of life. There are. But if you add anything to Christ, 
to fulfill happiness and pleasure and fulfillment and being. If you are searching for significance in some other place, it will always come up short. The most powerful thing in all the earth is the gospel. And I hope that you know it. And I hope that you have the gospel. And if you have the gospel, you have everything. If you don't have the gospel, you are empty. Today, take your little cup. I know we, it's been two years since we've been able to pass the cup. I ask our deacons, I ask our men today to stand at the door. I said, we're still not passing the plate yet, but at least you can serve it. And in that cup, yeah, you can start to tear off the top of it. But I need to remind you of something. That little cup represents the gospel. It represents the lengths of God's love. It represents that the things that so often we live for, the body, he would freely give to be broken. Not just give, but broken. And the life is in the blood, and the cleansing is in the blood. And there is nothing that can cleanse us from all of our sins except the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. The blood that was freely shared. And for those of us who've known Christ for a long time, it's easy for us to overlook the most valuable treasure of heaven. That is why we do this in remembrance of him. We should make much of the value of Christ. We need to remember it. We need to live it. We need to cherish it. We need to love it. No greater value. This is the foundation that everything in all of heaven is built upon. No one will ever go there without the love and the forgiveness of Christ. And I'm going to ask you to do something. In the next few seconds, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow your head. Go ahead. And I want you to confess between your God and your heart the things in your life that should not be there. You listen to the Holy Spirit. Someone said, I don't know what to say. Guess. I promise you, you'll hit it. We need some genuine repentance right now. Heads bowed, talk to the Lord. Now look up here. With a fresh confession and a peace on your heart, take the piece of bread. And picture in your mind the cross. Picture in your mind a body so marred that his own mom could not recognize him. That's the length of his love for you. You join in that. 
It was broken as it was given. Accept the love of Jesus. And take that bread remembering the sacrifice of Christ for you. Take the bread. Now look at the juice. The precious juice. When I think of the blood and how it fell from his body, you could have heard in the background the baying of the sheep and the lambs as they were being killed for Passover that week. But as the blood dripped from them to make a temporary sacrifice that would not last, Jesus was shedding the blood that would last throughout all of eternity. And I just want you to remember this one thing. Just one drop for you will do. But it doesn't matter how much sacrifice you give until you've received the gift of His love. You're still in your sins. But if you've confessed your sins and you've received the gift of salvation, it will never be brought up to you again. Praise God for the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Take that drink and drink in remembrance of Him.